Uh, Vince has asked me to uh, compare the techniques and come up with an answer of what would be uh, the best tap technique. He also asked me that in order to give a more international flavor to this meeting, to fake an accent. So I hope this accent is okay for you. <laughs> uh, when I go back to Chicago, then I'll go back to the you know, normal, normal speak. Uh, I'm a B. Brown consultant. That doesn't influence my talk. Uh, so we will go through a little bit of the definition. We compare the techniques, and uh, we'll go over the, some of the controversies, and we'll make some conclusions. Uh, in terms of the definition, is a very clear uh, um, technique performed at the fascial level between the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique. Can you hear me now? Better? Uh, so here in this dissection, I open a window. Uh, the belly button will be about there. So this is external oblique. I open it like a book. So this is the edge, and this is the other one. External, internal, and then I can see transverses. I can see the deep circumflex iliac artery going there. I can see uh, maybe T11 there. So that's a plane where the thoracoabdominal nerves uh, travel. Now, the techniques are basically two. Uh, there is one, you know, we, now we call blind, which is the one that was proposed to be done through the triangle petite. And then we have the ultrasound-guided techniques. I will start with the ultrasound-guided because it's easier to uh, uh, go through. Um, the ultrasound-guided technique was just recently described in 2007 by Herbert and others. Uh, and it was introduced in a letter to the editor. And actually, most of the history of the development of the top block has been letters to the editors. Now, here uh, you can see his picture, pretty straightforward. This is, uh, this is distal, this is proximal, this is the um, uh, subcostal margin there, iliac crest. The, the probe is placed laterally, and the needle is advanced to the plane between the internal oblique and the transversus. Internal oblique usually is the largest of all three muscles. The transversus usually is the thinner, and here is the abdominal cavity. Now, of course, sometimes, especially south of the border, gets a little bit more challenging. Here we're trying to do a tap. You can check the time there. A minute later, we arrive to a first plane. Several minutes later, finally, we arrive here. So, you know, as you can see by the projection of the needle, it's like we're coming, you know, from about Washington State all the way to Chicago there, uh, but eventually, you know, get into the plane. So in terms of ultrasound technique, pretty straightforward. Uh, we will go through some of the issues that you have to take into account, but other than that, uh, arriving to that plane uh, is a straightforward uh, thing. Now, the blind technique is a little bit more controversial, a little bit more um, difficult to go through. It was originally introduced by Dr. Rafi, that was working in Ireland at the time, now he's in Arkansas, uh, and he introduced it in a letter to the editor sent to anesthesia. It was a fancy letter because it was about three pages long with several figures, I think there were three figures, two on this page, describing a novel, what he called a novel technique, uh, and it certainly was. And uh, because there had been more uh, field blocks uh, that had been introduced before his, but they were mostly subcutaneous infiltration. And, uh, but evidently, the technique is pretty much uh, tied to the group of John McDonald in Ireland, who has popularized, and, uh, and his writing started in uh, 2004 with an abstract of a presentation he gave in a European Society meeting uh, was published in anesthesiology. So his first contribution starts in 2004, and the um, curious thing is that he called at the time the block the Rafi block, the regional anesthesia field infiltration of the abdomen. Uh, the first use of TAP, the name TAP, came in another letter to the editor in 2006 by one of his contributors, uh, uh, Brian O'Donnell. And he uh, uh, sent this letter to regional anesthesia and pain medicine. And he said that the block has been used in 12 patients uh, for prostatectomy with good effect. And the name TAP was first introduced. So it's a humble origin to the name TAP. The first formal study came by McDonald in 2007, which was just a few months before um, Herbert uh, did his introduction of the ultrasound technique. 
Now, which one is better? Now, here I'm dealing camels in Saudi Arabia. Eventually, I didn't buy any. Uh, here is the comparison between uh, McDonald's and Herbert's in their original publications. So you can see here is what um, uh, Rafi did, or McDonald did, to uh, you know, select his uh, uh, triangle petite, then the introduction of the needle, and then if you compare the positions of where eventually the, the needle ends, seems pretty similar. So let's go a little bit into, I'm sorry, let's go a little bit into the anatomy uh, see if we can come up with some answers. Well, so again, this is a dissection I have performed. This is the back. This is the anterior portion. I removed the external oblique, and I left part of the internal oblique intact. So you can see how uh, the nerves traverse on the surface of transversus abdominis. And here we have uh, L1, very close to the iliac crest. We'll divide into two branches, ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric. So, you know, the, 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 it's pretty clear that the nerves uh, traverse that plane uh, for almost their entire um, uh, course in the abdomen. Now, the important thing to know about the anatomy of these thoracoabdominal nerves is that it gives three branches, but the most important branch is the lateral branch, which is given about the level of the mid-axillary line. Now, this branch will produce a cutaneous branch that goes posterior and anterior, so that single branch is responsible for the majority of the uh, cutaneous innervation of the abdominal wall. So that picture already tells us that any block performed at two anterior, anterior axillary line or, or more anterior, will not pick that, that uh, important branch. So the, the block should not be performed any more anterior than the anterior axillary line. Now, in terms of the triangle petite, uh, the triangle is not only petite, but was uh, described by petite, uh, and is located between the latissimus dorsi, the external oblique, and the iliac crest. There are a lot of trouble with this tri uh, triangle. In, as a matter of fact, it can be absent in about a third of the uh, patients. Uh, so it's not a, an, an easy feature, but just looking at the boundaries, you know that if the external oblique produces the anterior boundary of this small triangle, when we pass a needle through a triangle petite, we cannot pass through external oblique. So, you know, just to answer some of the questions about what would produce a pop and will not. So you never traverse external oblique if you're going through a true uh, triangle petite. Now, is there any petite advantage? Is there any advantage going through the triangle petite as opposed to uh, just doing a lateral approach as it has been uh, done uh, with ultrasound? Well, if you ask Rafi, who was the first one to introduce this block, why did he use this triangle? Did he saw an important thing, did a mysterious thing that will lead uh, to, uh, um, uh, will lead after the introduction of a needle through that? And he actually has a very simple answer. Uh, he actually it, it thought about the triangle petite because it's the only place in the entire abdominal wall where the, ex the internal oblique is not covered by the external oblique. So it was like if I have to go under the internal oblique and I get out of the question the external oblique, now I can go more easily into the plane of the um, uh, transversus abdominis internal oblique uh, fascia plane. Now, Herbert's reasons for not using it, uh, and you can see how similar the, the two approaches are, was that the lateral approach, he thought he could see the needle better. This is what he wrote in his letter to the editor. And then that the bilateral block can be performed without change in position. So do both blocks without any problem. Well, last night, by chance, I got to sit next to him uh, and, uh, for dinner, and I asked him the question. And he said, you know, well, I wrote that, but in reality, what I meant was that is similar position. And that's what I always thought, uh, that, you know, that when he saw this, Rafi, and, and you see this, you think, well, we're going to end up about the same, the same place. Uh, now, insisting of, in the petite advantage, you know, here again, Rafi, here is McDonald, you know. Rafi did it in black and white, and McDonald somehow did it in, in color. But eventually, you know, they end up being the same thing. But so I went and I did a dissection because I see that petite could not be found on the lateral wall of the abdomen. 
So if you do a, a, a dissection, here is the midline, here is the thoracolumbar fascia, here is latissimus dorsi, here is the iliac crest, that is triangle petite. Uh, so this is gluteus maximus here. So now this is the lateral side of the patient, or the, or the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this case, the cadaver. So uh, you can tell that this cannot be the triangle petite. You cannot approach the triangle petite from the lateral side. Uh, now, even in, you know, in, in the pictures like this, you see that. So what are they palpating there? Uh, so you know, again, uh, I have a cadaver on the side here. I'm grabbing the side and pulling it up to see the triangle petite, in this case very small, but definitely posterior. That can now be approached with a patient lying on his back. So uh, if I put a cadaver on the back there, I notice that you know, gravity that does all these bad things to us uh, while we start aging, you know, produces a, a fold here on the external oblique wall, in the abdominal wall, but externally on the external oblique, and it's confused as being the uh, triangle petite. So this is where people had been finding triangle petite, but definitely the triangle petite is posterior, and it cannot be approached on a patient lying on his back. So <laughs> this raises a question, when we were comparing posterior approach with the lateral approach, actually we were comparing origins to origins. So they actually, we were not having any posterior evidence. Not even Rafi did a posterior approach, you know, the one that actually introduced the, the technique. Uh, now, insisting a little bit more about the posterior, well, people, you know, thought this new block, you know, now that with ultrasound, we're trying to put needles in all sorts of places, and now they come with this um, um, technique that seems so anatomical, so we start doing these blocks, but we never replicated or most of the world had never replicated the original study of McDonald, where he got um, distribution of sensory anesthesia between T7 and L1. We all saw that if we injected in the tap plane, we only get anesthesia between T10 and distal, which makes sense because, you know, the local anesthetic will distribute in that plane, but it cannot go over the subcostal uh, barrier where the muscles insert there in every one of the ribs, so it becomes a natural obstacle to the dispersion of the local anesthetic. But uh, the group of McDonald has not given in. There is some special thing about the posterior approach, although, as we can see, even his evidence shows that there's no posterior approach. First of all, you know, here is the best of the pictures. When we do a study, obviously, we submit the best pictures that we get. So this is his best picture. And so you can see that what he called the posterior approach originally, you know, end up very anterior here. Here is the point of injection there. And he puts an arrow there as seen, look how posterior it goes, but you know, it doesn't even get to quadratus lumborum. Uh, so nothing magic about that. That's a, a distribution of the local anesthetic expected. So how could he explain the fact that he thinks or insists that doing the posterior approach, that I insist which then have a posterior, could get this distribution between T7 and L1. So um, I have communicated with him through emails a couple of times, and he uh, uh, was very determined to, the, to demonstrate that this posterior approach was somehow uh, special. So eventually, he got it. In 2011, his group uh, published in Anesthesia an interesting paper where they did 13 volunteers, and four volunteers received the classical landmark approach that he called, what they call the posterior approach, but it's nothing else than the lateral approach. And then a new posterior approach, which is a little bit of modification uh, by Dr. Blanco in Spain, where the deposit of the local anesthetic, instead of being in the true tap, goes a little bit further and goes um, subperitoneal in front of quadratus lumborum. So right at the edge of quadratus lumborum, with the idea of producing what they thought is a paravertebral spread. So here again is in that communication is their picture of the posterior approach. Again, it's not posterior. And then the new posterior, which is done lateral. So here is the elbow of this thin patient here. So it's lying on the side. There is a triangle petite for them. The triangle petite should be way down back here. And they're doing basically the same thing, but the needle is directed a little bit more uh, anterior or into the, uh, the quadratus lumborum position. And voila, finally, they got 
the, the uh, evidence they were looking for. So you can see how they show here the spread anterior to the retrieval bodies here. And, you know, and if you get your magnifying glasses, maybe you see some branches here going, you know, a little bit in the pararetrieval region. When I reviewed this uh, for the first time when it was sent to North America, I was very surprised because as an anatomist, I did, I did not expect the spread to the to the paraverticular region. So I put it down for you know, a few days, then I went back again, and that picture was really bothering me. But here there is a very important telling sign. You can see here, this is the spread that the guy with the, they get with the most posterior approach. Here is the uh, uh, quadratus, and here is um, uh, psoas. So you can see how the local anesthetic expected, you know, you, you inject a little bit more posterior, get all the way to the edge but not to the paravertebral level, but a little bit of enhancement there. So what we need to uh, uh, differentiate here is between the spread, which would be talk about continuity, so there is a spread between the deposit of local anesthetic and the paravertebral region, and some isolated uh, 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 dye enhancement here. This is lymphatic spread of the, of the dye, the dye was taken by, uh, by the uh, lymphatic system and eventually concentrated in the thoracic duct. So that's the thoracic, thoracic duct. And here, you know, just to give you an example, for instance, you can inject in the testicles of a rabbit and eventually enhance the thoracic duct. You're not going to say that you spread the dye there, but actually the, spread, the dye was taken up by the institutional tissue, a lymphatic system, and eventually concentrated higher up in other levels. So to me, there's no evidence of spread other than just a spread through the lymphatic system. So it seems factual as that the blind and your ultrasound techniques are very similar, and, but also, although we prefer the ultrasound because it's more accurate, seems more accurate, must be performed proximal to the mid uh, anterior axillary line. The spread most likely is between T10 and L1. The subcosa is necessary if you need higher anesthesia. No evidence of paraverticular spread. And, you know, there's some communication about the higher level of uh, uh, blood levels of uh, local anesthetic, so maybe you should control the, the total amount. And so what is the ideal top block? The short answer is the ultrasound-based technique. Uh, now, provided, obviously, that the injection was not done anterior to the axillary line, uh, there's no convincing evidence to support any advantage of using the triangle petite, even if the triangle petite was accurately identified, and we know we ha it hasn't been. The posterior approach, the, you know, the quadratus injection, could potentially reach the paravertebral space, but if it's through the lymphatic system, you're not going to get any anesthesia. And if it's truly by a spread, which hasn't been demonstrated, it will have to reach sufficient uh, mass to produce a spread at the paravertebral level. So a drop of anesthesia getting to the paravertebral will not produce an, a paravertebral block. So that's all I, I have to say about that too. Thank you very much.